Okay. Hi, everyone, um, and welcome to this conversation today. Um, I'm really honored all the time to be able to share the space with you and to share evolutionary astrology and um, to get the opportunity to impart some of my thoughts on uh, the material that uh, we all love to, to share and digest. And um, <clears throat> today's video and conversation is going to be on the essential needs uh, part two. And um, I've got a couple of things that I'd like to share today with everybody regarding my thoughts again on the essential needs. Uh, there's a personal uh, sharing that I'll also be adding to this conversation in terms of um, what I feel personally about uh, how we can use the Jupiter through Libra transit um, and also to understand our relationship to the soul and what it's trying to accomplish and in its relationship to the ego. So we'll be looking at the essential needs, um, the how, it's like uh, Linda's written over there, the, the why and how associated with Taurus and the second house um, and how that's linked with our essential needs because it's the fundamental process of um, our survival and how we facilitate these needs. Um, in the first video, there was uh, an emphasis on that the essential needs is about the path to self-realization. It is the path to uh, becoming whole within ourselves. It's the, the path to recognizing that each of us come onto this plane and through our many, many lifetimes, we progressively pierce the holes through the Maya, through the illusion of separation. And we eventually come to a point within ourselves and we realize that the journey on earth and the human body that we um, use as a vehicle to actualize desires are to be merged together. And the nature of desire and the nature of the human body and ego is to be fused as one. And that path in itself, you can deeply objectify through the teaching of the essential needs and um, some other aspects of the natal charts, uh, or particularly the, the natal wheel that you can look at as how we as human beings relate to ourselves, how we develop the psyche. Um, and also, it's, it's a very profound teaching because when, when, we, when we get into relationships, when we naturally bond with people, um, whether it be the bonding that is through conditioning from our family members and parents through to relationships that we form with our siblings and then um, to go on to, to actual partnership relationships, be it the age of 16, not really something that uh, we generally tend to go, okay, this is what my soul is trying to learn in this relationship. But um, as we get older, we, we are looking for and co wanting to co-create conscious awakening relationships. And most, most of the world, because of the amount of consensus reality souls that are, that are out there, finding a conscious relationship is something that um, can sometimes be difficult for us because it means that when we are in a relationship that is conscious and that is working to um, develop and nurture this soulful connection, we do meet the shadow part of us. We do meet the, the parts of ourselves that remain hidden. I know from my own personal life, before I even got evolutionary astrology, and to be quite honest, thank God um, that I got it because it was able to actually objectify what I was going through. I wasn't even aware of probably 70% of what it is that I carried in my psyche. And part of the reason as to why I share this so passionately is because my relationship to understanding not only what the essential needs formula is about, but also connecting deeply with these archetypes and understanding conscious relationship building, you can begin to, to, to see how much projection, which is a very big part of the essential needs. We, we come in touch with the nature of our projection, whether it's conscious or unconscious. It's um, not a bad thing. It's not a, you know, in the sense that it, it serves a purpose for us and a very big part of our 
creation of relationships that are conscious is rooted in the recognition of our projections, the recognition of our unconscious material. And I'm very, um, I'm very sensitive to um, words that can come off as being used in like certain, in like a large majority of, of what I call awakening people, awakening souls, like uh, a kind of um, spiritual community, if you want to use that, like the word shadow, I think it used, gets used very frequently and the depth of it is not as, as um, and I'm not saying this is for everybody, of course, a lot of you that are sitting here today and listening to this in itself uh, are very familiar with what, what that really means. But things like the word shadow and, and recognizing how part of that is integrating into our relationships and that's the holistic experience, their essential needs can help us understand that and objectify this process. So the theme and the reason for having, for me feeling that this is a very big part of um, self-discovery, that I feel everyone at some point should at least take six months. And, and again, this is a random number. I'm not saying that that's, you know, go do that. It's just my Virgo needing to have something specific. Um, but at least take six months of your life to, to recognize the nature of your essential needs. Um, as a way of developing not only your relationship to what the patterning is about and how to actually create wholeness with inside of yourself and heal yourself. Um, I'm part of the Pluto and Libra generation. And what I've noticed through my observations and work is that this is a generation that has a very deep need to understand themselves through relationships and as well as recognize the um, ways in which their childhood has affected their relationship patterns as they are getting older, because this is so much more of a heightened um, theme for them. Okay. And I'm not to say that anybody else that hasn't got strong seventh house stuff or Libra stuff is excluded. It's South node in the, in the seventh house, South node in Libra. These are all still dynamics that apply, but you'll be hypersensitive to, to learning a lot about yourself through relationships. So understanding the essential needs and how that operates for you and objectifying that um, can give you a great deal of nourishment. And I feel that this is something that, that is really what I'm wanting to cultivate here is a need for nourishment of your soul, of yourself. It's the true path to healing yourself. It's not, it's about recognizing who you are as a being that is not, um, connect like interconnecting with others and just uh operating from an unconscious state but really giving yourself and other people the um wonder and the beauty of accessing depths of yourself that might necess that might be covered in material of unresolved emotions displaced stuff past life trauma etc and not really accessing the vibrancy so Again, another beautiful aspect of connecting with your essential needs and understanding why you would want to spend some time with it is allowing yourself to see the beauty of what you are and to not be um, caught up in confusion. And for me, particularly through my own story, I have a lot of confusion around the mother archetype um, through like cues and unresolved material regarding that and also to the to the father as well i have a very strong kind of like mother father dynamic in the chart that is that has got a lot of essential need growth uh, attention i uh, needed to put a lot of attention in that and what i've discovered through that is that for most of us that are seeking mature conscious authentic relationships and you as an astrologer that's listening to this as well that comes into contact with a lot of people especially pluto libras especially you know pluto in the seventh house or south node in the seventh house south node in libra a strong venus connection to the chart and when you identify that the soul is looking to understand themselves through relationships that um there's a great deal of, of uh, depth 
that you can offer this client when recognizing what the essential needs can do for yourself and for the other person. So you like understanding yourself can give you an intense amount of um, depth when counseling and working with another soul because of your own personal story and how you relate to that. And that giving um, a lot more, I don't want to kind of go over the, the same thing over again, but a lot more depth to the experience. So, Again, that's, that's what I wanted to just open up and share with today. So um, I'm just going to jump onto uh, a slide. And uh, what I'm going to do here with the slide and my, my intention is to give us some de definitions, okay, that I'm going to be using so that we can understand more about how to access the essential needs, how to practically work with your essential needs, um, how to help others in your practice as a way of relating to how relationships work and removing a lot of the unconscious material that we bring to, to our lives, like I was saying earlier about myself and how there's an immense amount of confusion around what the, the parents represented to me and how I internalized a lot of that stuff, how that becomes um, uh, you know, you can use the word like use the word shadow, but I would say aspects of re relationships where you find yourself needing to take um, a very deep look at where this wounding has occurred and how that prevents you from accessing um, the heart. And I think that this is something that is also very integral and very key to relationships going forward as we have Uranus and Aries, we have um, Pluto and Capricorn, we have Jupiter in Libra at the stage. Jupiter moving through Libra is giving us a very profound um, sense of awakening around core belief systems and truths that we have internalized throughout our lives that could possibly not represent authenticity for us, that could block us from feeling um, trust in our lives. I think this is something that's incredibly essential when recognizing the more depth that we can go into when we understand how to practically work with the essential needs. So another kind of point to highlight around how do we activate and live a conscious essential needs awareness okay so the first slide that we are looking at today is the actual uh, framework of the essential needs right so if you have a look over here you can see that taurus the constellation taurus is the second house and that's our first marker we have the constellation pisces and the 12th house and of course then we have Libra itself, okay, and that's the seven. So in a very short term, we can say the, the essential needs is two, 12, and seven. Now, these constellations and these archetypes, these archetypes, they have a relationship with each other. And very simply, the relationship that Taurus has to Libra, Taurus is a subjective awareness, and so therefore, it is still very much how we internalize and relate to ourselves on a very deep and personal level, okay? It's the dynamic within us in which we relate and identify our essential needs, how we identify the uh, way that we prefer to be with ourselves, the way that we prefer to be in the physical form, and also how our physical nature has its own limitations and its own um, needs for sustenance, okay? The ability to survive on the material plane. I feel like, and I, I'm gonna go a little bit broad here in terms of this, this uh, conversation, just derail a little bit. But for any of you that have watched and understood evolutionary astrology in a very deep way, you'll hear Jeffrey Wolf, T uh, Wolf Green talk a lot about the Virgo Pisces axis that was influencing humanity for the last 2000 years. And um, when you, when you look deeply into the nature of conditioning, 
that the planet and human beings and consciousness has um, essentially evolved through in relationship to this Virgo Pisces consciousness, you'll notice that we've developed this very strong relationship to an external savior. Now through patriarchy and the, the, the development of the masculine ego, um, we have externalized a higher God and then given it a symbol and that symbol then essentially separating us from our own body. Okay. Because we're seeking um, outside of ourselves. And because of this, the relationship to the physical needs of the body, and we can even call this a relationship to the divine feminine in a very loose way, right? The, the physical body because of this being the case and because of the way that we have developed and explored away from the physical form, what we see on the planet today in terms of, um, and again, this is very, very general. This is not something that you can, I mean, I live in Sweden and their recycling um, structure is phenomenal. So they do take care of their waste. They do take care of the, the consumption and then reproduction and, and recycling process. And this is, you know, this is again, not something that is uncommon, but our relationship to the body is very, um, disconnected and part of us becoming more conscious of who we are in relationships and how we operate in relationships is rooted in understanding our desires as a way of recognizing the soul. So the second house, the Taurus element is the process of us coming back into the form. And when we come back into the form, we awaken all sorts of funny things. Because when we come back into the form, when we come back into the body, we begin to recognize that there is a whole lot of material that we carry that we didn't even know was there. Or maybe we did to a certain degree, but we didn't understand the complexity of it. And so therefore, as we come back into the body, we notice all this emotion that is all in these different places. And we start to then have to process and go through and reintegrate aspects of ourselves that have had maybe some negative responses to. And a very simple example that I could give you is um, pay attention to how your face operates during a day. Notice how very subtle experiences when you experience some stress or you experience some, some tightness. And again, this is, a, this is something that, that you can practice as a way of recognizing how the body is responding to its environment in relationship to what you are in relationship to. Okay. So an example, like I said, I can give you is pay attention to your facial expressions when you go through certain experiences in your day and notice how your body and muscles sometimes even stay in that form for me. And um, I highly recommend going into it and researching it and having a look at what it does. If you're into the process of healing the body and that is called this, this thing called bioenergetics. It's really, really fascinating, and I don't want to spend time focusing on it, but bioenergetics really helped me understand the way that the nervous system and the muscle system interact with each other relative to the thoughts and emotional experiences that you are experiencing and digesting as you go through the day. And I notice how my face through certain interactions with my kids that are under the age of four that are still trying to develop their own relationship to time and the rules and some things that they can't do. Sometimes they get like super frustrated and I'll watch how my face will make us well, I feel how my face will make a certain act. If I don't allow for that natural stress to be released again, that stores in my body. And it's not uncommon for us to, um, to feel confused when we engage in, relationships with others and in relationship with other things. And we have all this pent up frustration or this pent up stress within our body, this pent up stuff that we carry. And we wonder why sometimes we get sick. Not all the time do, is it because of this, but a very large majority of the time we get sick because we don't allow for the releasing process to occur relative to what we experienced. And this can range from just a mild kind of thing where for me personally, I have a very strong Capricorn signature in myself. And so 
when my child decides to climb on the, 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 the table and I feel uncomfortable because it's secu- the, the, this, it threatens my feelings of security and safety, I, I generally go like, I freak out. So not freak out, but I, I respond by, by my adrenals setting in and saying, I've got to sort this problem out. If I don't allow my endocrine system and adrenals to, to come back to a state of relaxation after that, I get a lot of muscle tension around the back and of course, um, and my shoulders over here. Now imagine, okay, just, just for a moment over here, imagine getting into a, a conversation with somebody that you care about when you're carrying some of the stress. And again, a lot of the stuff is not uncommon to us. Again, it's not like new information. And I just want to put that out there because I don't want to sound too as if like this is new information, but a lot of the time we interact with somebody that we love or we interact with people and situations after carrying a great deal of stress through the day, and we begin to notice that our capacity to have and hold space for the actual reality or the actual truth of what's happening in interaction is very limited. So we generally tend to then become more susceptible to um, projecting more of our unconscious material on or holding somebody accountable for the information or essentially allowing us to feel less uh, and that's just the word, I think, just, just less conscious of our interactions, which leads us to having our hearts uh, closed down in an interaction because whenever, when somebody else feels threatened through maybe our stress that's coming off us because we're impatient or we're not really being sympathetic or we're not listening, and this is another thing that we'll move on to regarding the nature of the second house and the nature of listening um, as the other person and not for our internal place, when we're interacting like that, we can, we can find ourselves in these situations. And of course, sometimes it can be very, um, it can take days to really release that emotion in, a, in an argument because maybe we said something that wasn't okay. Maybe we felt like that wasn't really where we, were com- where we wanted to be coming from within ourselves. And so a lot of the time, the nature of the physical body and how it is being treated and cared for is a very strong contributing factor to the way that we can become more conscious in relationships and be more authentic in the way that we interact with anything. And again, it's, it was beautifully said in a couple of other uh, uh, Zoom meetings, and I feel that this is a very strong point to put across when, especially when you're dealing with clients, that Libra doesn't necessarily have to be just about relationships to people. It can be about relationship to anything that you have and how you feel towards it. Notice how, if you get frustrated with your computer, especially during Mercury retrograde, and man, that was really, really difficult for me, the Mercury retrograde, because there was just so many funny things occurring. With I would notice that I would I would notice that an object that has absolutely no meaning and has no life to it, that it's it's just material, would all of a sudden become the uh, person or experience in which I needed to get angry with, right? Or frustrated with. And I would recognize that in that moment, the frustration wasn't really something existential. It was more of the unconscious or through the process, conscious um, stress level that would be with me because of just how my, my life is at this stage and, and how much of my uh, um, sympathetic nervous system is activated through a lot of actioning Uh, and stuff like that. So being conscious of how the physical form works is a very big key to understanding how to effectively um, get in touch with your essential needs and your um, way of understanding your body. And so this is part two of this. And that is that, and this is connected with the Virgo Pisces stuff, is that when we come back into the form, when we come back into the body and we begin to release all these emotions and begin to detoxify ourselves, we start to notice that we access a part of us that has a lot more um, self like compassion, compassion to ourselves, compassion to um, the world and the state. And, um, and again, I don't feel like we should all run the save the world program, by the way, I feel like it's highly dangerous to do that just to segue there because the more we pay attention to something existential that's larger than what we could even begin to, to, to think of, we will just get drowned in, in the experience. So, so like compassion and the relationship to nurture should always begin at home because when you can cultivate that, you can bring more of your higher self out, which is the key here. Taurus is the connector. 
it's the connector between the soul and the physical form because it's the emotional body in which we allow us to connect with Neptune. So Pisces, when we look at Pisces over here and the 12th house, we recognize that through separation, we, we will always see things outside of ourselves that are causing us pain, that we perceive it as that causing us pain for us to feel victimized by it. And most of the time when we feel victimized by something, it's because we're unable to process the, the nature of the experience in some degree. So what happens is, is that the endocrine system releases certain um, hormones into the body uh, that tells us that there, there's pain, especially in the uh, pituitary gland. So there's pain. And in that moment of experiencing this, we feel that it's going to continue forever. So it then creates the natural panic of fear. So fight or flight kicks in. And these emotional layers stay with us. So Pisces, initially, when we're growing up, especially, especially when we're very young and we don't understand the nature of life and we're interacting with our parents, we are super connected to our higher beings. We're super connected to, to the essence of what we are in a, a, a sort of like non-visible sense. The ego is still forming, but the baby's connection and our childlike connection to spirit is strong. And we can all objectify this. We just need to look at the way that, that babies operate and the freedom that they have. That's the state that we want to return to, ironically. But as we begin to experience life and we begin to experience Saturn, right? And this is the, the next part of the slide here that I want to bring across. As we begin to, to experience Saturn and Capricorn and the experience of limitations and the experience of our... Um, parents in that sense particularly our parents because we're so young our relationship to them is not seen through their own limitations their own trauma their own childhood um, emotional security patterns that have been manipulated and distorted through um, humanity's incessant need to consistently bombard us with fear propaganda but through the process of seeing them in such a holistic way we never actually look at the experience as an objectifier. We can't that whatever it is that they're saying to us is their fault. So what happens is, is that we, we internalize a great deal of our experiences, especially shame. Shame is the most intensely um, destructive energy pattern that we can have. And, on one level, there's a shameful experience of internalizing it where we didn't know that it was our fault and nobody showed us remorse. And that becomes part of the essential needs, right? Because when, when, you, when you look at the essential needs, I've drawn in conjunction at these angles. The essential needs is that we internalize the experience, Neptune, through our own relationship to ourself. And then when we get older and we begin to then work with relationships and operate through them, we tend to project our unconscious material into a relationship in the early parts of it because we're unaware of this material. And as we become more aware of our process in relationships, we begin to recognize these patterns. And that's when we begin to really work through our stuff and become more conscious and authentic. But we need to first objectify what it is that's been happening to us. So part of the essential need healing process is having to first go through the realization that we carry a lot of imprinting from our early life in which there is emotions that have not been processed in a way that is healthy and that allows us to feel the heart. So for most of us in relationships, and this is why I feel like relationships are so incredibly difficult for us, and it's not to say that we can't have co-creative, wonderful, joyful relationships because I, you know, I experienced that as well. But we do, we do go through periods of time where it's difficult for us because we get confused about what does it mean to honor ourselves and recognize who we are and still hold space for another person to feel um, loved when we are maybe cut off or drawing a boundary, as an example. So part of the experience is having to first go into the emotional body. And anybody that's had a fourth house Pluto transit 
Uranus transit to your fourth house or any major transit to the fourth house or maybe the 10th house in that sense as well, you would become acutely aware of this conditioning. And it becomes sometimes really, really difficult to handle in the beginning because all of a sudden this just begins to come to the surface and um, it can be difficult to process, which is why for somebody you know, that, that are astrologers, practicing astrologers, and you do work with, with um, souls that come to you with certain um, struggles in their emotional development and, and their, their ways of trying to bring out more uh, authenticity in, in the way that they operate, um, this would be a good place to start in terms of objectifying the emotional relationship that they've got and looking at the, the archetype of the moon in the chart, looking at the archetype of Saturn in the chart firstly, and really getting in touch with that dynamic first before jumping into effective co-conscious relationships, because that's a process, like I said, that I'm you know putting across here. And I hope and I haven't validated it a thousand times yet. But so we have this imprinting, okay? Mom and dad tells us that uh, we can't have this. We internalize it as it's never going to end. And we don't feel we shut down emotionally and progressively over our lives as we get older, we have these emotions and what happens is they become precursors to um, habits in relationships where we can develop uh, co um, codependency. We can, especially for Pluto fourth house souls that are learning about um, becoming more empowered in their emotional reality and security. They can, as, as Jeffrey writes about, and I've, I've seen it in so many souls that have got through their fourth house experiences is that they will naturally attract a parent into their life. Uh, sorry, not a parent, a relationship into their life that represents the missing parent. And part of that process is because we need to first heal the mother and father wound in us as the first step in realization of, of, of authenticity in relationships. Okay. And for most of us, um, Chiron has been in Pisces, 27 degrees. 26 degrees. It's been uh, quincunxing Jupiter and Jupiter has been in conjuncting that for quite some time. Jupiter has been in Libra. Jupiter has also been opposing Uranus. Um, and of course the square to Pluto, both Uranus and, and Jupiter. And we've also had Saturn making a square to, to Chiron. And we've just recently had a Venus retrograde. So a lot of us in some way, shape or form. And if you look at the outside world as well, especially with the consensus reality, you can see it very, very clearly where a lot of politicians and other forms of souls clearly have got unresolved material that they project into the reality as a way of asserting their will where they felt him disempowered. Step one, step two, uh, realizing where we have um, felt growing up that our sense of nurture cancer fourth house and our emotional patterning and unconscious emotional associations to experiences becomes the, the the way in which we bring what we need to relationships so like in my case as an example um my first all my relationships so far have brought in um a a partner that had parents that would represent what I seeked in my parents. So I would identify the lack in myself regarding what I was looking for. I would then attract a, par a, a partner into my life that would have the parents represent what they were, what my parents were missing. And that would make me feel fulfilled. I would start to progressively notice that in the relationship, what I convinced the person was wrong with them, or when I got into arguments and I would project, or I would talk about things that, were not about myself, so not taking ownership of my own relationship to myself or not being conscious of myself a lot of the time. I spent an incredible time, amount of time in a disassociated state uh, because of a lot of emotional trauma that I didn't even understand was with me. Um, I drew this, this types of relationships in. And what I started to notice in the essential need formula, because I have Capricorn ruling my 12th house, naturally the 12th house is then, Saturn is ruling that, and Saturn's also in my 10th house, I would bring in the lack of the father. So they would represent that. And then that would stop me from, I would want to be the father in, in, the, um, in the relationship. I would want to be the mature man that wants to take responsibility and, and guide and protect his family. 
but I wouldn't be able to do that because I've attracted people that were doing it for me already. And because of that, I would actually recognize and feel inside of myself that that role was taken away from me and get angry with the other people because I didn't know that that was what was, I was actually missing inside of myself. So I attracted relationships that would actually create those dynamics, those crises in order for me to come to the awareness with inside of myself. Now, of course, in the first two relationships, I wasn't actually aware and the current one I'm in right now, I wasn't actually aware of that until I started to work with my essential needs and go, Oh, this is actually pretty insane. And as I began to process and work through this material, I became more conscious and authentic in my expression. And this is why, you, you know, raising vibrations and the work that I do and why I'm expressing this is from my own direct experience of how I've started the process of healing this material that I carry with me. Now we go over to the cancer archetype and I'd noticed that I would also draw in partners that had a deep mothering thing. They just needed to mother. And it was like, why do I feel so suffocated in my relationships with, 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 with partners that had such a strong cancer archetype or needed to mother? And I'd realized that the reason why this was the case is because I was not identifying the lack inside of myself. So I would attract somebody that would look after me and then it would prevent me from actually confronting the nature of the limitation in myself. So by understanding this inner and outer dynamic, I became aware of the way in which I bring my emotional security patterns to a relationship. And that's what cancer represents in its relationship to Libra, the codependency, how we bring what we feel and what we need in a relationship to make us feel secure. And listen to the words I use what we feel and what we need in the relationship for us to feel secure. Needs, Taurus. Emotional security, Cancer. Relationship, to the formation with the other. Now, in the Capricorn part, if anything exists outside of our security, we're going to need to control that. It's not allowed. Make judgments. That's why consensus reality is so filled with judgments. It's because we need to be able to control what we don't understand so that we don't confront the emotions of that, unsecu- that insecurity or that chaos, which, which um, brings us to why there are, there's so much unresolved emotions and resentment that form in relationships. Because we can, be, before we can even begin to be authentic in a relationship and understand what we are projecting and how we're growing this, we've got to understand what those dynamics are. So like I said, again, look at your Saturn, look at your 10th house, that the planet that's ruling the 10th house, uh, sorry, not the planet, the sun that's ruling your 10th house, look at for its ruler um, and look for Capricorn in the chart. Synthesize the three together to get the definitions, the construction, the, the outer authority that governs you growing up that you need to then destroy or uh, liberate yourself from age of the 21. That's when we begin to process that liberation factor. Decondition yourself from those internalized um, emotions where we have felt victimized by the experience because we couldn't understand. And then go over to the moon, the, um, the, the ruler of the fourth house, and of course, where the cancer lies, and recognize your relationship to how you nurture yourself and what is essential for you to nurture you. From that point, you can begin to then understand what is the essential way in which you have come to give authority to yourself, okay? What is the way that you give authority to yourself? That's your satin path. How do you emotionally mature that allows you to have authority in what it is that you've grown in? And that's a big part of becoming more conscious in your relationship because the more you become conscious of your authority, the greater your capacity to draw the right boundaries in relationships that give you more authenticity with only yourself and with the other person. It gives more clarity. And with Saturn in the 10th house in Scorpio, for me, this is something that is intense because not only did both parents not support that development growing up for me, I can't even see it outside of myself as what is the correct way and not as the correct way. So I just have to bump my head consistently all the time and recognize the amounts of confusion I have around what are, what are okay boundaries and what is not. And I don't even know this because I have such a traumatized like sense of um, understanding my, my essential needs because I spend so much time 
uh, in a state of not understanding what that was about. It wasn't cultivated with me. So, and that's part of my chart here is to, is to recognize how my own like desire is operating. So when you become more conscious and authoritative in your own story, you can become more conscious and co-creative in a relationship and say, Hey, in this relationship, these are my essential needs. I feel like I, I need to fulfill them as a way of activating my soul. I want to prevent us from creating resentment in myself for you not res facilitating it. I would like you to tell me what I would like you to know what mine are. And I would like to be able to be responsible for actualizing them. And if you can feel that you can respect what those are, then you've got a clear boundary in place, right? Eliminating confusion. 90% of the reason why relationships are so difficult because we don't know ourselves. We haven't spent time one week in the woods. You don't have to go to the woods. One week in the woods in a cabin by yourself, just with who you are. And then come back and, and understand and integrate that in self. I feel like it's incredibly important for us to take at least four or five days or you know, less, depending on your life, and spend time completely alone. This is talking from a Pluto and Libra generation, Soho, that's polarity point is Aries. We have to spend time alone. It's healthy for us because it gives us a sense of connection to who we are so that we can become more, we can become more abundant in our relationships, right? This is, the, this is the beauty of Taurus. It gives us abundance if we are giving abundance to ourselves. So cultivating this is, is step one. And this is self-love. So in the next slide over here, before I jump onto that, I want to talk about expectations, okay? Entering a relationship or anything in which we draw expectations on the experience and then finding ourselves being disappointed or angry and projecting that because the outside self was not facilitating those expectations or it wasn't meeting our expectations or whatever it is that we idealistically put onto the experience is what we think it will, what we thought it was going to be. We always find ourselves with Jupiter and Libra helping us recognize where we put expectations on things. And I feel that's a very, very big part of learning how to recognize what types of expectations we place on our partners and on ourselves and how we can sometimes actually create a lot of crisis for us by maybe placing the expectations too far ahead, maybe placing the expectations too little, depending on the range in which we are in this experience, and allowing us to become very mindful of how we place expectations as a way of becoming more conscious and co-creative in relationships and allowing essential needs to be present with us, right? And this is something that the Taurus archetype will, will be heavily influenced in is, what are your expectations relative to your own desires, relative to your own inner relationship to yourself? What standards do you have? And how do you put that in on another person, watch them not facilitate them because they can't, and then allowing yourself to be disillusioned. And disillusionment can be a very painful thing because on a more biological level, it's almost impossible for, for us to not respond with disillusionment first with denial and anger. because the body in itself, through its endocrine system, through the hormonal release, through this, the natural ways in which um, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system works, and so on and so forth, the chemical structure and molecular way in which we operate through an experience that makes us feel shameful or that we've done something wrong or we haven't, um, we didn't see correctly, is for us to, to not accept it to begin with because it means that we have to embrace something within ourselves that are incredibly painful. And whenever we experience pain growing up, we always, and in most cases, the pineal gland as well as the pituitary gland will secrete um, certain chemicals into the body to numb the experience. That it's what its job is. So we would disassociate slightly. And if we don't re -inter like interact back with the experience, then that emotion and chemical structure get stored in the body so when we actually do become disillusioned through the experience through something that we may be internalized when we we're younger becomes a very like painful experience because the body has to go through has to go through the part of me has to 
re-go through the experience that it did 15 years ago or 10 years ago or five years ago, depending on when it happened. So there's always a need for rejection and saying it's not there because that's what happened for us. We had to reject the experience in order for us to survive. So curving the experience of understanding this process is recognizing and objectifying what were my expectations? How did this situation meet my expectations? How did I place expectations that couldn't be met? And how does that then allow me to objectify the nature of what I'm essentially interacting with in this relationship? It's a very profound thing to become aware of because it does pull you back into your body. It does pull you back into your emotions. It does pull you back into how you feel about something. And when we, be when we begin to recognize that and objectify our own sadness, we begin to objectify our own sense of fundamental disempowerment that is rooted in maybe not being recognized in an argument, maybe feeling that the strategy that we use to try and um, do what we all want to do fundamentally as human beings is allow for the heart to be open again so that we can feel acceptance and warmth and be embraced. How do we do that? We can't do that when the body is under this deep process of um, chemical release where we feel threatened. So when we're angry, we feel that our boundaries are not being honored. If we feel guilty in the experience, it's generally because we weren't allowed to feel angry. And so guilt sets in that there's something wrong with us. All of these experiences create the way in which we fundamentally struggle to have objectivity in our relationships. And part of the process is the way that we interact with the relationship and interact with the experience. So with Taurus over here in the second house, the first process that we need to come to and it's a difficult one because I spent a great deal of time um, through becoming conscious in my, my relationship and becoming more holistic in my way of, of understanding what is the soul and how is this, how am I interacting with this was I wasn't objectifying my own essential needs. And all of us on a fundamental level require the need for love, require the need to be embraced with warmth. So the Taurus archetype always is saying on the neath surface, when we're in an argument, when we're in a disagreement is, we need to get clarification. So the next question becomes is, how do I, with the Taurus archetype, connect with the Cancer archetype? So how can I then identify what those needs were when I found X, Y, Z in the relationship? Okay, so we have a communication, we disagree on something, we feel a certain way. How do we first identify those emotions? How do we identify how we feel? Once we recognize that process, we can then begin to validate that Leo. We begin to then say, okay, right now, this is how I felt in the experience. This is how I experienced um, how. So we have the facts, what happened. Then we have how we felt about that. And then we allow for ourselves to be validated through the experience, which can be very difficult because if nobody's wanting to listen to another person in the relationship or in, in a communication, it can be difficult for us to feel embraced and warmth, which is when we shut down. And that's when we become in danger of allowing ourselves to get angry and tell the other person X, Y, Z. At that point in time, the most healthy way to respond to the situation is allowing yourself to say, whatever it is that I'm interacting with right now, I can protect myself, I can honor myself, and that's the best I can do. And it's very difficult because the body wants to have oxytocin. It wants to have love. It wants to be embraced. And to say that it has to draw a boundary to create separation immediately tells the pineal gland that there is a separation. And so therefore it must release um, pain, right? The chemicals that, that numbs the pain, we're in pain. So every single one of us look to your Venus in your chart, whenever really, really tough emotions are being experienced as a way of recognizing how you begin to interact with this experience. So somebody triggers you, look to your Venus and understand how you, how you are going to respond to that. So I have Venus in the eighth house Virgo and I can hyper rationalize everything. I have Mars conjunct that Virgo and uh, Mars conjunct that Venus in the eighth house Virgo. And I promise you I can hyper rationalize the disempowerment outside of myself brilliantly. 
But what fundamentally is difficult when there's emotions is how do I identify with my own initial needs? Because so much of that Virgo archetype is, is pounded on feelings of unworthiness, on shame. So immediately I just say, oh, well, it's your, like, I can identify the disempowerment in the other person and bring it to the surface Virgo and say, this is your, this is where you're fundamentally flawed as a way of creating the emotions to feel more secure in myself. Right, that's how my Venus works out. And I mean, there's other aspects to it as well. But look at your Venus when emotions come up when you're triggered. Recognize the patterning. Notice how you begin to identify your emotions. Because remember, the Taurus archetype and the Libra archetype is what, rule, is, what is co-creating with Venus. So it's how do you relate to yourself and how do you relate to others? So how are you emotionally identifying with yourself? How are you emotionally identifying with others? How are you emotionally validating your sense of self? How are you allowing another person to emotionally identify themselves? When we get to this process here of Virgo, it's the slowing down and maturation. Okay. Recognizing where we could have, where we can grow in the experience, where we can slow down and process the stuff, right? Virgo, you know, there's a lot of key words around Virgo, around crisis and, um, you know, you know, self, um, lack of self, not, not the word I was looking for, um, the process of, of lack. But I'd like to see it in a po more positive way and say this is a slowing down process in order for us to just be present with what's being experienced as a way of cultivating awareness because its polarity point really is Pisces. So we want to just be more like present with the experience, so bringing us back down to a very slow process. And then, of course, Taurus's connection with Libra is then how do I listen to the other person? Not from where we are, but where for the other person is. And that's difficult because how do you hold space for somebody when you're feeling angry with them? How do you hold space with somebody when you are in a situation where the adrenaline is moving through where your body said, fight or flight, I need to run away? That's where it's important to understand that if this is the case, we can always step away from it and say, we need a timeout. We need some space to cool down. And then when we come back, we reintegrate and listen to what the person's really saying. Listen to the emotions. You can hear when somebody will say words, but behind the words, there's a sense of sadness. So there's a sense of disempowerment or a sense of not being heard as an example. I mean, this is really co-creating um, as a parent is really allowing your two-year-old to have a moan and for you to sit and say, okay, I'm hearing you. Even if they can't articulate words, they're still trying to tell you how they're experiencing their reality. That was shut down for most of us. How many of us are sitting here today and watching this video honestly had their parents all the time say, at the age of two, I'll hear what you have to say. It's difficult for us to think like that because for most of our lives, children were really much about being um, seen and not heard because they represented chaos. They represent chaos because their sense of groundedness is not established. So when we interact with them, we immediately shut down who they are because our relationship to them is different because we're not in that space. We've already gone through our satins. We've already gone through the relationship with trauma. So we can articulate our feelings, but they can't. So it's another way of recognizing that when you're actually having a conversation with somebody that's also probably feeling their own trauma, their own woundedness, to see them as a child. Because inside that body is the child. Just, and, and it's scary because when you begin to look at the outside form, you go like, that's impossible. You're a grown up, you're an adult. And I keep on saying like, just because I'm 33 years old doesn't mean that there are parts of my emotions that are stuck at the age of five. So we still have a lot of feelings and emotions in different places in which that growth hasn't taken place. And they come up during relationships. So hearing the other person when they're in that state or in that place and with yourself as well, it always begins with compassion to yourself. This is not a forgive and forget archetypal structure. It's very, very important for us to not just forgive people without recognize, allowing them to recognize where they can feel remorse for themselves as a natural path of, of healing. So where we can hear, we can hear them as an inner child. We can listen to them as their emotions. And that's when we can begin to really become intimate. Scorpio. All relationships, when we open up and we allow vulnerability to be present with us, is deeply rooted in how much we trust. And this is something that I feel is, is immensely important when it comes to 
co-creating a relationship and cultivating a relationship, cultivating a relationship where there is essential needs. And that is our ability to trust. It's been shut down when we were young through trauma. It's been shut down through experiences that we internalized that we're going to stay like that forever. And part of our experience of opening up in relationships is recognizing where we distract or move away from vulnerability that gives another person the, the ability to, to, to have emotional intimacy with us or emotional transparency. So Scorpio is where the mutation happens. Libra is the capacity for us to really allow fairness and equality to work, but Scorpio really does trigger the mutation through, co through recognizing our limitations in ourselves by another person representing the mirror for us. So in conclusion to the time that I've shared with everybody today, and I really hope that I haven't um, taken up too much of, of the space, and I'm sure that maybe some of you would find some questions and stuff. Um, the, the main intention, the main focus was that if we are to become more authentic with ourselves, if we are to become more emotionally honest with ourselves, especially going forward, especially going forward in terms of life and being somebody that represents a, a beacon of light for human beings to feel like there is a sense of hope, it is about processing and understanding what conditions you, what has conditioned you, what, ha what are the emotional imprints and authority clearing that out, allowing yourself to then become more abundant as you, bringing more to your self-care, more to the joy to yourself, so that when you enter relationships, your capacity to become more holistic and share truth that is profound as a way of loving, not as the Valentine's love, social expectations, norms projected onto us in terms of how we have to feel guilty and ashamed for certain behaviors, but authentic love that is rooted in ups and downs, and sometimes getting angry with the person and saying, I love you at a soul level, but right now I'm still trying to develop my boundaries. And I feel like you're doing that or the other way around and allowing ourselves to be honest with that and cultivating that. And it's a very difficult path, but it is the one that is the most rewarding that I've found so far. So thank you so much for uh, allowing me to share this with you. I really hope you enjoyed it. Uh, thank you very much, Simon. I really enjoyed it. It was fantastic. And so I will now allow everybody else to say thank you. Please go ahead. Thanks, Simon. Thanks, Simon. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much for listening. Simon, thanks so much. Catch you next time. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.